Good morning. Today we'll have updates from Emergency Management Director Foran and Transportation Secretary Flynn. We'll also hear from General Roy of FEMA with an update on the Montpelier Mobile Home Park. Our teams will continue to work with local partners on assessing the damage of this week's flooding, which will be important as we determine next steps. As we've discussed, there are certain thresholds that need to be met to reach a point where a new disaster declaration can be made with FEMA support to follow. As you may recall, there are two levels, public assistance to help with infrastructure and individual assistance, which is a much higher bar to clear. Our towns are well equipped and familiar with that process when it comes to public assistance and that work is underway. Whether or not we meet thresholds for federal help, it will be important for the state to have an understanding of the damage people and businesses have sustained. So as Commissioner Morrison went over yesterday, if you're in immediate need of major help, call 211. But if you're working to clean up and make minor repairs, focus on that first. Contact your insurance company, then report your damage online, if possible, at vermont211.org. This will help us determine whether we meet the, the federal thresholds and see what the state needs to do moving forward. I want to reiterate, there is, there is no active program in place at this stage for direct financial support, but we need the data to see what might be possible or what should be done down the road. So again, report damage, take photos, and save receipts. Our teams will also continue to reach out directly to community organizations across the state to identify needs. In the meantime, again, I'm asking all Vermonters who are able to step up to help your community in any way you can. We know there are people who could use a helping hand out there, and even the little things can make a big difference. So with that, I'll turn it over to Director Fora. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. Thanks for being here. A uh, quick update from uh, across the state. All rivers have receded below flood stage, but Vermonters should remain vigilant. River levels are still higher than normal, and most have extremely strong currents. Everyone is encouraged to stay clear of these potentially dangerous areas, continue to respect all road closures, and never drive or walk in a flooded area. To date, the state has received no reports of death or injuries resulting directly from this flood. During this event, we activated nine swift water teams that made a total of 12 rescues. As reported earlier, three people were rescued from a home in Jamaica, and there were nine separate rescues from vehicles caught in floods. Our teams have also assisted with some voluntary evacuations from residences that were threatened by water, but not inundated. As of late yesterday afternoon, we demobilized the remaining two swift water teams. Those teams remain available, uh, but they are back in quarters. The Emergency Operations Center remains activated. If towns need additional assistance, they can contact their, us through the, your, their Emergency Management Director. The team at the Emergency Operations Center is in the process of collecting damage reports from towns and state agencies to determine if the state qualifies for public infrastructure repair assistance, as the Governor mentioned. All the shelters across the state have closed as residents have used them, have now returned to their homes or made other arrangements. The Vermont Emergency Management website and social media channels will list any other shelters or warming centers should they come online. We are working closely with 211 to capture damage to residences and businesses as a result of the flooding. As the governor mentioned, if you have immediate needs for shelter or food, please call or text 211. If you do not need immediate assistance, but your home or business was damaged as a result of this flood, please go online to vermont211.org to report your damages when your situation is stable. Please use the online form to report damage. If you do not have access to the internet, you can make your damage reports by calling 211 and speaking to the operator. If prompted to do so, leave a message and they will return your call. The damage reports will be used to quantify the damages to residences and businesses to determine if we may be eligible for federal assistance in the wake of this event. At this time, we do not know if any communities or the state as a whole will qualify for federal assistance, but we want to make sure that we accurately compile this data so that we understand where we are in regards to the thresholds that the governor mentioned. Thank you. With that, I will turn it over to Secretary Flynn from Agency of Transportation. 
Thank you, Director. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, I'd first like to take you back to the floods of July and August, <clears throat> and I'm pleased to report that the last road that was closed from that event opened last Friday. That is Route 107 in Stockbridge. So regarding this week's events, <clears throat> we are at this moment at two roads remaining fully closed. Those are US 302 from Berrytown to Orange, and Vermont 73 in Sudbury from Brandon to Willow Brook. One road, and only one road, is partially closed at this point, and that is Route 108 at Spruce Peak. I mentioned yesterday that is a project that the resort is undertaking with Stowe, um, <clears throat> and we're working with them uh, and want to get the word out that they're working to get that open to temporary two-lane as soon as possible, and then they'll determine a permanent fix thereafter. There are no issues with rail. There are no issues with air. The Lamoille Valley Rail Trail has been assessed. All of the large sites that were damaged from July uh, were, were survived, <clears throat> and construction on those from the July recovery continues. There were 15 minor damage areas from this week's events, very minor, and that should be um, all repaired within a few days. The Missisquoi Valley Rail Trail has been fully assessed. The agency has conducted three bridge inspections, uh, two in Milton and one in Tunbridge. We have three planned for today, one in Mount Holly, one in Plymouth, and one in Chelsea. We are working, VTRAN staff is working with the town of Fairfax today, town manager and the road foreman. They have a slope issue on local roads, and the town, we're told, intends to get a contractor on that site today. As Director Foran mentioned, uh, with VEM and others, AOT helps to survey the landscape with respect to towns. As of this morning, we have spoken to 75% of all the towns in the state, and that information is passed to VEM to the SEOC for their awareness. Um, from that, there are currently um, 33 towns that have indicated some degree of damage. I don't have any extent as to what that actually is. You heard yesterday, I believe, when Secretary Boucher was talking about schools, much of the issue just happens to be we're seeing, or we were at least yesterday, we're seeing mud road conditions like we would have seen in perhaps March or April. So that could be part of what they're dealing with. We have 37 damage sites on the federal highway network on our state system. I mentioned we have two roads closed, but we still have 37 damaged sites. The only site of real significance is the U.S. Route 2 into St. Johnsbury where there is a slide. So when I say damaged sites, I want to put that into perspective. It's not all like it was in July. And we have three contractors working with us today. And that concludes my report, and I would turn over to General Roy from FEMA. Thank you, Secretary Flynn. Appreciate that. Um, good morning. Uh, before I uh, hit on the uh, direct housing uh, discussion, I just want to cover a couple basics here. Um, uh, as we've discussed many times, you know, uh, FEMA is assisting Vermont uh, in three programmatic areas. The first one is individual assistance. And under individual assistance, uh, FEMA has provided over $24.6 million to Vermont is affected by the floods uh, from uh, this summer. Uh, and of that, $22.9 million has been allotted for housing uh, repair, and about $1.7 million went towards uh, replacing personal property. Uh, we continue to help from owners who cannot live in their damaged homes uh, and help find a safe and temporary place to live. About $3.5 million has been approved for over 1,500 residents uh, to rent housing uh, while repairs or replacement of their houses uh, continue on. Um, under public assistance, uh, our public assistance programs, which provides funding to repair or replace damaged infrastructure, uh, we have uh, 1,458 projects right now with more to come. Uh, and it estimate is about $600 million worth of, of, uh, of uh, costs associated with those projects, $600 million and growing. 
Uh, to date, we've obligated uh, 22 projects for just over $700,000, but these are the early stages, uh, and we expect uh, those to, to grow very quickly. And in fact, we estimate that uh, we'll have over $50 million by the end of January uh, obligated for Vermont uh, for public assistance. Uh, and then the last uh, and a long-term one is our interagency recovery coordination, our long-term recovery. Uh, and we're working with the appointed chief recovery officer, uh, Doug Farnham, uh, to take a look at uh, focus areas in which the federal government can assist Vermont. Uh, we've activated all of the six recovery support uh, functions from our federal partners, uh, and we've identified five focus areas for the long-term recovery. Uh, increased housing, uh, kickstart economic recovery, enhanced resilience of critical infrastructure, increased capacity for communities to plan for and recover from disasters, and lastly, enable and enhance food security for uh, at-risk populations during disasters. Uh, so we'll work hand in glove with the state task forces uh, to bring about uh, whatever assistance we can uh, from the federal government for that. Uh, and then under direct housing, uh, I know that's the subject du jour based upon the decision with the group site. Um, so those who cannot find appropriate rentals of their own, uh, like we talked about the rental assistance program, uh, are being helped through our direct housing and leasing programs. Um, we did an initial assessment and there were, based upon uh, either substantial, substantial damages or, or destroyed, there was a population of 260 people who met that requirement uh, at the very beginning uh, of the disaster uh, that we reached out to. Uh, and of that population, uh, we started with uh, somewhere between 50 and 60 who expressed interest in FEMA helping them find uh, temporary housing for up to 18 months. Um, there, are, uh, there are a sequence of things that we do to place uh, individuals in temporary housing. Uh, and again, they're sequential. So the first thing we look for, because it's the easiest thing to do, is uh, uh, multifamily properties that need to be repaired. We go in, we repair them. Uh, as part of the lease process, we are able to put our applicants into those. That's the first lever we pull. The second lever we pull is for uh, our mobile home use units or some places recreational vehicles, which we wouldn't do in Vermont because of the weather. Um, so we take a look to see where we can potentially place mobile homes on either private properties or on commercial properties. Uh, and if that's not working, then the next one we pull is to see if we can expand a commercial park to add additional spots. Uh, if that doesn't work, then we move into what's called direct lease, in which we look for um, apartments that are available. Think of corporate locations, you know, so if your company sent you to Vermont, you know, they typically have a, 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 a rental that they'll put you in. Uh, so we put a, a, a request for any corporations that may have those available for us. And then the very last lever that we pull is the group site for mobile homes. Why? Because it takes so very long to put that in place. Well, in the case of Vermont, uh, we recognized very early on that there was a housing challenge before the storm, only exacerbated by the storm. So what did we do? We pulled every single lever at the same time. Um, to try to get ahead of, 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 of the winter time. Um, and so in order to do that, we work very closely to find a group site that we could put in place. Uh, in this case, Montpelier looked like the best location for us to do that with. Uh, and we actually entered into agreement uh, to utilize that facility uh, should we require it. Uh, and we continued on with that planning. Well, this, you know, as we're getting ready to actually move forward, the direct lease program came forward uh, as it normally would have and said, okay, we found X amount, a number of uh, facilities for you to be able to use for your applicants. And there were enough for us to be able to utilize to take care of those people we were working with, uh, which had been 25, uh, reduced to 21, and as of this morning, it is down to 19. Uh, the two that uh, went from uh, from 21 to 19, one is uh, is actually uh, was able to uh, is in the process of purchasing a home, and everything went through. Uh, and the other applicant uh, found uh, a, a permanent apartment. Uh, and this is what we expect. The longer it takes to place people, 
you know, the chances are they'll find their own permanent solutions, which is ultimately what we want. Um, but that's why you saw us move forward on the group site, and now we're, we're moving to put people into direct lease because we pulled all those levels simultaneously in order to try to help people as quickly as we could. Uh, so I hope that explains uh, the, the process that we utilize uh, to help our, uh, our applicants uh, here in Vermont. I'm sure you probably have additional questions of that, uh, but uh, bottom line up front is we want people to know that, that those who have received assistance from Vermont, if your uh, status changes um, and you need additional help, please contact FEMA, you know, 1-800-621-3362, 1-800-621-3362 uh, to update us on where you are. The team that we have here in Vermont has made over 8,000 call-outs to those people who have been impacted by the storm. And because of their efforts, they have actually been able to provide an over $8 million of additional assistance because they were able to update their status. Uh, so we want to make sure that people have the opportunity to continue to reach out if their status changes. Okay. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to the governor and stand by for questions. Sir. Thank you, General Roy. We'll open up to questions. For Officer, or, you go. Oh, I'm easy. Okay. Uh, for Officer Roy, um, kind of talking about the direct housing and trailers and everything, there was that contract signed with the city that involved some things such as infrastructure and kind of other money. So if you could explain yeah. a little bit what happened to that contract now the infrastructure, the water, sewer that was going to yep. be going up there. Certainly. Um, so the contract we actually had with, with, with the city was for the property itself. Uh, and then uh, we would continue, you know, if we were going to place mobile homes units, we would have put the infrastructure in. We're obviously not going to do that. We, we're not going to spend tax related dollars that we don't need to. Uh, but we do have a, a fixed term lease with the city that's being negotiated with GSA in the city. Uh, and so they're working towards agreeing how much that's going to be. So Montpelier will end up with money. I'm just not sure at this point how much because it's a, an agreement between GSA and the city. Thank you, sir. Why, why did this announcement seem to catch the state by surprise? Um, to be honest, it, it, uh, the timing of it was we weren't sure when the direct lease was going to uh, come to fruition. Um, and based upon what we assessed the market was, you know, we weren't sure that, that anything would come of it. And then all of a sudden, you know, in fact, the, the three national vendors were able to come up with the properties uh, the units that we needed to facilitate it. So not only was the state, you know, I hate to say this, but not only was the state copyright surprised, we were actually, you know, pleasantly surprised to see, oh, wow, there are our properties here that will be able to support our, uh, those who need assistance. When, when did you get word from those organizations? Late last Friday, actually, is when, we, when the word came down on that. And so we worked very diligently to ensure that there was going to be enough matches for the people we had for the direct lease and and make a decision on on pulling the plug on the group site. How, wh where are these? You mentioned there's three national organizations. So who are they and where are they? I, you know, I'm not sure I can release which companies they are, and nor can we actually say where those properties are. I will tell tell you that we are able to place two individuals in Lamoille, and. 14 individuals in Washington County uh, into that direct lease program. Oh, by the way, we also have individuals we're working with on the other uh, type of, of assistance, which is the mobile home units. So we've got two going into, uh, into a location in Windsor County, and we've got three going into a location in Orange County, and we've already placed one individual on a private site here in, Bur uh, uh, in Barrie. One of the big concerns at the beginning was we couldn't find places that weren't in the floodplain. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to tell me exactly where, but yeah. how, how did we come to this decision or, or how, where, where did, how did we find these, these, you know, yeah. these parks that aren't in the floodplain? Uh, so um, the ones actually in Windsor County are, are uh, managed by State of Vermont as well uh, for, for housing locations. And then one in Orange wasn't in an impacted area at all. Um, so, uh, which, which allowed us to place them. And, and when will these, I know they're, the trailers are being staged, yep. when are they going to be moved and when can people move them? Certainly. In? So all, all, all five of the ones going into commercial parks are actually in place right now. And they're going through the sequencing of, of energizing them, checking them to make sure that's safe. 
um, and then they'll license in individ individuals into them. Uh, we're hopeful that, that within the next week or so, uh, the ones that are in orange will be completed and potentially the ones in Windsor. As to the direct lease program, uh, we, we believe by the end of next week we'll have the first person in a direct lease a location uh, and, and are shooting for mid-January to have everybody uh, in their location, which is great because the group site, we would have been struggling to get them there by the end of February. What does the communication look like with, I guess, the city of Montpelier with all this? Because talking to local leadership over there, they were pretty astounded and caught off very much off guard. Yes, sir. Um, I, I, I can understand that. Um, again, as, as I said, we were kind of surprised that direct lease came through as, as, as well as it did as well. Um, and all I can say is, is that when, when we found that we had the capability to, to uh, save taxpayer dollars and take care of uh, the applicants, you know, we, we made the right decision, uh, and then we began to engage uh, with the city. Uh, quite frankly, you know, the weekend ran into it, and that's why, you know, it kind of, the, the information kind of slowed down. Uh, I will say that uh, one of your brethren was well ahead of the ahead of it by talking to those who were we were working with and hearing that they were getting offered places to stay other than the park um, and and that kind of you know um, quite frankly you know started getting the word out before we even had a chance to you know to pass it on to the city and the state. General Roy, you also mentioned was it six hundred million dollars that we had in, in damage from this just this past summer's floods. Yes, sir. Do you know what like a state match on that would be? I know it probably de depends yep. on what bucket and what project, but like certainly what, what do you great question. So so right now uh, the cost share for Vermont is twenty five seventy five, um, and uh, with some cap some small caveats. Uh, for instance, the the, the president approved one hundred percent for. Uh, debris removal for up to a 30-day period uh, within the, the first 120 days of, of, the, of the storm. So the state gets to pick what was the most expensive portion and get that at 100%. Um, and then we had 100% for, for emergency protective measures um, uh, that they can pick the most expensive 30 days and do, do it for that as well. Everything else right now is a 25 uh, for the state, 75 for Fed. However, uh, once we exceed uh, I think it's 111 plus million dollars, so short of 112, um, that the, the, the state is eligible for transition to a 90-10. So 10% on the state, 90% for the Fed. And we, we're, we're trying to get there before uh, town day, uh, uh, town uh, voting, voting day of, uh, in March. I'm not sure uh, because the complexity of the projects if we'll get there or not, but we, you know, with $600 million worth of damage, we know we'll get there, we just don't know when. Maybe just a quick question for the, you, the, the governor. Uh, I mean, when you see sort of these numbers about the state match and $600 million, what do we have to pay? I mean, how, how do you take that into account when you're building your budget? Well, again, we want to make sure that we have the match available, uh, as we did last year. Uh, with some of the uh, the match for all the federal programs that came along, whether it was the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and, and so forth and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill and uh, those, uh, we need to make sure that we have the match because we don't want to let any federal dollars slip through our fingers. Um, so when we're building our budget, we're considering all of that. Got a couple folks on the phone. We'll start with... Emma Cotton, VT Digger. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Great. Um, I've got a few questions um, related all to the flooding on Monday. Um, I wonder if you could tell us if there have been any damage reports to 211 so far. Um, you said yesterday that it would be a close call whether we can you know, get federal assistance for this. I wonder if that's still your calculation based on what you know. I, I really haven't received an update on the the calls from two one one, but uh, I don't as know if Eric. As of seven a.m., we have as of seven a.m. we had twenty calls into that line, uh, so we're still analyzing the information. 
sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, I also wonder if you might be able to talk about how the state checks in with marginalized communities during a flood like this. I'm particularly thinking about people who don't speak English or uh, people with disabilities. How does the state make sure those people were properly informed about what was coming and that they were safe, um, sort of in general, and also uh, with regard to you know what happened on Monday? Uh, we do have translation services, but perhaps Eric can comment on that further as well. Yes, that's a population that we're always concerned about, so we uh, anticipate their needs and try to work with them uh, through the local EMDs, so the local EMDs know their local constituents and, and know what their needs might be. Uh, we also work through interpreters, and the PIO will work through ensuring a language. Um, multiple languages are utilized in our press releases and through our um, public messaging. So we do try to to uh, address those uh, individuals in a way that they can understand and comprehend. So, but it is something that we continuously strive to improve. Great, thank you. And then my last question is: Governor Scott, yesterday you said we'll learn something from this storm. I just wonder uh, if you could expand a little bit on that. What do you think we're going to learn? Um, you know, we'll we'll learn more as uh, the damage assessments come in. Um, but, but again, I think um, having these two storms, uh, one right after the other, and the hypersensitivity uh, of people during, during the holiday times, as well as uh, just coming off from recovery, is something that we're cognizant of, and, uh, and we went into this uh, understanding that as well. But, um, but I, th I think I, I'm, again, hardened by the compassion of Vermonters uh, their toughness, their ability to to get back up and and do the hard work uh, to uh, to help their neighbors and and to help their communities. So so far so good in that regard. Uh, but um, but we want to make sure uh, that we address all the issues uh, that we're not missing anything. Um, the communication aspect is so important. It reinforces uh, the importance of all of you in communicating. Uh, our perspective and, uh, and the perspective of, uh, of those victims as well. So um, we're all in this together, and I think it's just, uh, again, reinforces that what we've done is working, but we need to do more of it and make sure that we nothing, nobody slips through the, uh, the cracks, uh, so to speak. Great. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Carly, Vermont Public. Carly, are you muted? No. We're not getting audio, Carly, so um, we can come back to you in a minute. Um, we'll go back to the room. For Secretary Flynn, we have Christmas right around the corner, holiday season. The FAA, FAA and airports are expecting a record amount of traffic with the pandemic continuing to wind down. I guess, what are you expecting on the roads here in Vermont over the next week as the holiday season kind of kicks off? What do I expect on the roads? Mm -hmm. Like you expect a massive influx of people compared to years past? Or I haven't seen projections that are going to indicate tremendous increase of traffic, but we know that there always is an increase of traffic during the holiday period. So. Uh, that would seem logical. Um, I also have not seen at this point what I would call a problematic weather forecast that far into the weekend regarding road conditions. So that would be favorable at this moment, but that could change at any time, as you all know. <clears throat> so again, it's just an opportunity to message to everybody uh, to drive carefully. Don't drive impaired. Pay attention. Wear your seatbelt. Uh, and give somebody a break, especially if you see our plow trucks out there, give them a break so they can get the work done so you can get where you need to go for the holidays safely. So thank you for that. Carly, I think we heard some audio come through. We'll try it again. Okay, great. Can you hear me now? We can. Okay, great. I have a question for Governor Scott. So like General Roy said earlier, back in August, he was that there were around 260 households who needed direct housing assistance. Now it's down to under 20. I think it gives the public an impression that people impacted by the July flooding are taken care of, but we know there are still families bunking up in tight quarters together, staying in very temporary situations with family or friends after losing their homes, or now you know some of them have experienced flooding again this week. 
What is your overall assessment of how much Vermonters have recovered since the flooding in July? Yeah, I, I still believe we have a long ways to go. And I think some of those situations you described are more frequent than maybe we realize. Uh, staying with family and friends uh, is not a solution, a long-term permanent solution. So <clears throat> we want to make sure that they reach out to us uh, because as uh, General Roy has said, uh, FEMA can still support them in trying to find at least temporary housing throughout the, uh, the first 18 months of the declaration. Um, but we also uh, want to, it reinforces the fact that we need more housing in Vermont. Uh, you'll hear more about that in, in uh, the coming weeks. Uh, it'll be a focus of mine as it has been over the last seven years. Um, but we need to, uh, to really uh, put that on steroids, uh, for, in, in, for lack of a better term, because there's no doubt uh, we need more units. We need thousands of units uh, in it right now. And um, at the pace we're going uh, at, this, uh, at this moment, uh, it's not going to fill the need. And those folks uh, that are in those temporary situations are going to need permanent housing uh, after, um, after they wear out their welcome with their friends and family. Great, thank you. Governor, a lawmaker told Appropriations yesterday that she sees a softening in the administration on safe injection sites. Uh, any softening on, on your stance? Uh, I, I will speak for the administration. There's no softening from my standpoint. Thank you. So that bill that is being introduced on, on day one about that pilot program if you've heard they're going to be introducing a bill allowed for up to two safe injection sites, you would, you're still opposed to that and it wouldn't well, be Well, there's more to the bill as I understand it. I haven't read the bill, just to be uh, fair. Uh, and uh, this is not passed uh, out of committee at this point. I know that they're contemplating this on the first day of the session to pass it out of committee. And then I don't know if it goes to another committee or it goes to the floor at that point in the House of Representatives. But there is a process, uh, a step process in the future. Having said that, there's more to the bill, um, from my understanding, the decriminalization of, um, of drugs um, through, throughout the heroin and other uh, substances uh, that are part of that bill. So there's more to just the safe injection sites uh, to this that I'm, uh, I'm concerned with. Thank you all very much. Have a great Christmas.